Hello guys, do you hear me? Mike, here is Mike on the top of the screen and Nikolai on the bottom of the screen. So like don't don't try to like you, you should try to understand who is the one who is going to give a talk. So like please think like th these guys are all in the whites, but like Mike has black stripe there. I don't know, like I, I'm I have not very good eyesight, so I can only pretend that there is a black thing. So, uh, Mike, you are working in SIA Poland. What is this company? Uh, so, first of all, hi, dobry uh, dzień. Um, yeah, I'm working at SIA as an architect. Uh, the company itself is uh, an IT services uh, provider, like various different stuff, uh, including the, the software development. Um, yeah. Okay, so I heard that SII is one of the largest providers in Poland, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's the, rather a huge company. This is possible that I heard from you. I, I think yeah. this is, I think this is possible. <laughs> like, like, uh, okay, so that is very interesting because for large providers, there are lots of distributed staff questions that the, that are rising during their growing of the company. Uh, do, you, do you have a data center somewhere outside of Poland or you're just country-wide distributed systems company? Um, well, so in general, um, we are working uh, here from Poland, um, at least the, the, the Polish uh, branch, let's say, of the, of the SII, but we are uh, working with um, the, the customer from, um, from outside of Poland as well. So um, mostly with, uh, at least in, in my branch, so in Poznan, we are working with, uh, with clients from, from Germany, uh, from Austria. Uh, oh. Yeah. Okay. But do you, do you, in general, do you... we are building a distributed systems. Okay, yeah, that's for, that's exactly what I wanted scale. to ask. Yeah. What distributed systems do you build for? What for what? For monitoring, or for uh, various different things. So we are building platforms for for the customers uh, that look for a, like a well suited solution for their problem. We are supporting them in implementation of their system. So everything from I don't know payments, uh, processing medical data, things like that. A lot of different products, a lot of different um, um, industries that we are cooperating with. So you mean you're kind of uh, the comp? How it's, I, I I remember that name, but I already forget how these companies are named. Like ah, outsource? Is it outsource company in some sense? Mm. Well, initially it was an outsource company, but we are more than that. Um, so we are also providing some consultations. We are also providing some architectural support. So it's not only a, a body leasing company, let's say, not only the outsourcing. Okay, I see. And how big your department is of distributed system guys? Uh, well, I'm not sure whether we have one, uh, but in general, it's like almost 5,000 people at the moment in Poland. So it's, it's pretty big. Um, and five thousand, five thousand people who are, who knows what distributed systems are. I hope so. I'm doing my best to uh, to make them know that. Uh, but no, in fact, we don't have something like a distributed systems department. Let's say, uh, but I would say that majority of our uh, systems that we are building are somehow distributed, and uh, somehow distributed systems are basically almost everything that is being built uh, um, these days. I could say. But really, five thousand is is an amazing number. So it's I can't I can't even imagine how many people can understand distributed systems to some normal level. So that they yeah, can. So if you would, sorry. Yeah, if you would go outside of the street, there is a high chance that uh, the random person would know it. <laughs> oh, that's in it's in Poznan or in general in Poland. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. It's not that. It's not that good. It's still hard to explain what I'm doing for a living. Let's say for my grandparents. So, yeah, pro probably your grandparents worked with like these huge clusters. I don't know. Like, I, 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 your parents or grandparents are programmers? No, no. no I'm the black the... sheep in the family. Yeah. Okay, I see. 
<laughs> that's that's not unfortunate, but like that's that's what you get for being yeah could be pro- worse. <laughs> could be worse, but you still have to resolve all the computer issues in the family, it seems. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. So let's stop with, with the small chat. That's 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 the burden of the programmer, right? So to to solve all their computer problems in the family. Uh Okay, so probably let's move to the talk. We will have a talk and we will have 10 minutes Q&A session at the end. Am I right, Nikolai? I heard something like that. It's going to be like that. Hi. Okay, Nikolai is not going to answer my question, but anyway. Uh, there, don't forget that you can ask questions on the... On, I, I, I okay, okay, yeah, somewhere here on the... On the left to mine or on the right on the screen, there is a text box, text box for writing your questions. Please don't be shy, ask the questions. I don't know exactly what is there, how are you going to answer the questions? Like in the, running during the session or just at the end? After the talk. After, After the, talk. the talk, okay. So, so yeah. still, still you can, you can answer, ask the questions in, on, in an ongoing manner, but the questions are going to be Answer, answer it on the on the end. Okay, Mike. Good luck for your talk, and Thank Nikolai. You. Good luck. See you after after that. Cool. So let me start. Uh, hello again. My name is Mike. Uh, I build distributed systems for fun and living. Uh, and today I would like to talk about. Um, a fundamental law of building distributed systems, which obviously is uh, the famous CAP theorem. And uh, the CAP theorem is probably the most well known from its graphical representation as a triangle, uh, where each edge represents one of three uh, properties. So consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And on top of that, we have a catchy wisdom saying that at any distri- shared, distributed shared data system, uh, we can pick at most two at a time. Uh, and in fact, um, this is quite close to how um, how the initial CAP conjecture looked like um, when Mr. Eric Brewer was um, preparing it or formulating it around 1999. Uh, the nice thing about the triangle is that it makes CAP easy to remember. We all know how this CAP triangle looks like. Uh, but at the same time, the triangle has as much CAP as cappuccino. So, okay, the letters may be fine, but at the end, we are losing a lot of context and a lot of important details. Um, So that's why some were trying to go one step further, uh, adding categories that are a consequence of uh, of possible choices, as well as trying to categorize some of the systems um, that we have uh, as one of those groups. But in fact, instead of making things better, it was making things even worse. Uh, leaving a lot of misconceptions and yeah, a lot of misleading information or even even wrong from time to time. And then we have the product announcements like the one from uh, Amazon uh, AWS S3 team from from last year, uh, claiming that their product that was previously known from um, from the availability and scalability, but not necessarily from uh, from uh, something more than eventual consistency. Uh, has now something more to offer in terms of consistency. And the natural question is, how do they do that? Uh, Does this mean that AWS team basically like gets all three at the same time? Has the cloud changed the rules so much that the cap theorem is not relevant anymore? Um, Well, the cap is not uh, a random hypothesis that we just found on the internet. Uh, It's a proven theorem. kind of a a gravity, but for distributed systems. So you have to obey it even if you don't like it. But at the same time, CAP is also quite misleading. Uh, So what's left of the CAP theorem after more than 20 years since it has been formulated? Should we still care? Uh, What about the tools? What about the databases that we are using? Uh, How to place them according to to the CAP theorem? Uh, well, if you're looking for the answer for those questions, that's exactly the talk um, that you should participate in. Uh, so let's start from a quick recap to make sure that we are on the same page um, about all those three properties. We can start from the easiest one, so availability, which is being defined as 
like this. So a system is available where every request received by a non-failing node uh, will result in a non-error response. So in other words, it means that whenever there is a read request, um, this read request has to return some data. Um, and whenever there is a write request, we just have to accept it no matter what. So eventually the system has to be always available. Um, then to complicate things a little bit, um, let's introduce the concept of a network partition. And the network partition is uh, a communication issue, which basically splits the, the nodes in our distributed systems into uh, different groups. And um, the nodes uh, from one group cannot communicate to the nodes from uh, another group, while all the nodes may still be available from the outside world. So it could be that they are, for example, available uh, from the internet. Uh, however, unlike availability and consistency, partitions are not something we uh, really choose. It's just an inherent part of, of the networks and of the distributed systems. So in fact, even if in the best uh, built network, a partition could basically happen. Um, and when the partition happens and when those nodes are still available from the outside, it might happen that um, both groups will be, um, will be queried for data or for both groups there will be uh, some write requests. So as on the example that you can see here, uh, at the end the system has to decide what should be the value of, of x. And this is, uh, this is what, what the cap is really about. So the cap theorem is about the decision making. One of the possible decisions is to say that only one side of the system will still be uh, available in order to preserve the consistency. Usually the side that will still be available would be the majority side, so the side that contains the majority of nodes, as there should be only one majority, uh, basically. So on the other side, we will reject all the read requests or, uh, and all the write requests in order to preserve the consistency. because. Even a single inconsistent read would invalidate uh, the C in terms of cap theorem. Um, then as an alternative, we could say we will accept all the reads and writes no matter what. And of course, as a result, we could have some, um, some inconsistencies, uh, but we will decide to handle them later somehow. And for at the moment, the somehow part doesn't matter. Um, we just the most important thing here is that we just decide to be always available. So to preserve uh, the availability at the cost of, uh, of consistency. Um, however, one may ask, well, what about the node failures? So if we have two nodes like A and B and uh, A cannot, and, and the B is down, um, so isn't it also a kind of a network partition? Uh, and the answer is, is not. So network failure is, uh, node failure is not a network partition uh, because the network partitions are more about the communication, about the network, but not about, uh, about the nodes itself. However, uh, we may argue further and say that the failures, downtimes, happen pretty frequently. So even if our um, system will be bug free, uh, we still need some maintenance windows. We still have to upgrade, perform upgrades from time to time. Um, so those kind of problems will will happen. Wouldn't it be um, wouldn't it make sense to basically include them somehow into in the cap theorem? Um, and the answer is that well, effectively the cap theorem is a bit covering those pieces because if we have two nodes or two group of nodes and one cannot communicate to another um, on the color side, it is quite it is almost impossible to determine whether the reason for that is a network partition, just a timeout, so a slow network, or a failure of the remote node. And that's why effectively the strategy of handling network partitions um, has some practical consequences. Hey, right, we've covered two properties already. Uh, let's jump to the most tricky one, so to consistency. And while consistency have many different meanings in various different contexts in computer science, um, in terms of cap theorem, whenever we see the consistency, we mean uh, linearizability or the strict consistency. And the, strict, and the linearizability uh, has been defined as following. So all the operations should behave as if they were executed atomically 
on a single copy of a data. So effectively, this should be the same as executing all of the operations like, like one by one on a single node. So in fact, a linearizable distributed system uh, would pretend that it's not that much distributed. Um, one of the scenario that is not possible with uh, linearizability is a situation called a stale read when um, a read request um, returns the outdated value. So right after, with linearizability, right after writing the new value, so in this case, x equal to 2, it, is, it, it won't be possible anymore to get the previous value from any uh, of, the, of the reads that, could, um, uh, that will appear later. So as you can see, the linearizability is rather strong guarantee that uh, we could make use when building our applications. Uh, but what about the non-C systems? So what about those systems that decided to, uh, to, to uh, preserve, let's say, availability? Well, the consistency itself, in general, is a spectrum, whole spectrum of models and different guarantees. And we have different guarantees because the more consistency uh, we need, the more we have to sacrifice in terms of performance and fault tolerance. If we'll take a look at, uh, at the uh, hierarchy of the consistency models, uh, we'll see that uh, below linearizability, we have something more. Um, for example, one of the models is called read your writes, which basically says that if we have a process that writes something and then performs a read, this read request should return uh, the, the new value. Or we have a causal consistency where we are trying to preserve the operations, the order of operations which are related to each other somehow. So at the very end, the eventual consistency does not have to mean no consistency at all. But what about the ACID? So whenever somebody says consistency, like this is the first thing that comes to, um, to somebody's mind. Um, and if we'll take a look once more at the hierarchy, we will see that in fact, all of those um, transaction isolation levels are basically in a uh, separate subtree of, uh, of this hierarchy. So they're somehow different. And the answer is, that the ACID is about transactions, while, uh, while in the CAP theorem, we are talking about operations. So the operation is basically a read or write request, a single one, while the transaction is grouping uh, multiple reads uh, and writes and, and trying to execute them atomically. So this is, this is the main difference here. Um, also, and when we are talking about ACID, the consistency is about the invariance. It's about... Um, moving uh, the, the, the database or the system from one consistent state to another. Uh, so in fact, we should not confuse ACID with CAP because those are com two completely different things. Um, so um, how we should formulate now the, in a more practical way the, um, uh, the CAP theorem? And instead of using triangle, we could say um, the CAP theorem says when the network partition happens, uh, the system must have must choose between the availability, so being always available, and consistency. So in this case, linearizability. This is essentially what the CAP theorem is all about. Now, let's jump back to the AWS S3 that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Uh, for those who may not know what the S3 is, we can say uh, in a simplified way, that is a cloud-based hash table for blobs, for binary, binary data, for files. So it, 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 it's a key value storage for binary data. Uh, and those binary data are being organized in buckets, and each bucket contains objects. Um, what is important from the design point of view, uh, the S3 is redundant by default. Um, so um, our data that we are putting into S3 should be uh, replicated across multiple availability zones, uh, which all have their own power supply, redundant network connection, and things like that. So in terms of reducing the probability of various problems, including the network partitions, um, the S3 design should do a pretty good job. And before 2020, um, the only thing that we could count on was uh, eventual consistency. Uh, but then, out of the sudden, um, we uh, we've seen this, uh, this announcement that um, S3 now provides strong consistency. Uh, and the question that like, immediately came to my mind was, well, what does it mean? So how much cap does it have now? Is it uh, a linearizable system? or not. And to answer this question, I've jumped into the documentation of the S3 and especially the chapter about the data consistency model. Uh, and what we can find there is that the S3 provides 
strong read after write consistency for puts and leads. So of course, read after write sounds like something uh, like like read your own writes. Uh, so the, a weaker consistency model that I've mentioned before, which is of course required by linearizability, but on its own, it doesn't mean that we have a linearizable system. If we'll go further, we will see that in case of concurrent writes, uh, the latest timestamp, so the latest write will uh, will win. And that still does not provide us an answer whether the system is linearizable or not. Um, but what is even more interesting is that the buckets itself still remain eventually consistent. So at the very end, we have kind of a hybrid where some of the operations uh, have this strong consistency, like read after write consistency, uh, but the buckets itself are still eventually consistent. Um, there was a, a blog post from uh, Mr. Werner Vogels about um, the S3 and how they achieved this, this consistency. Um, in the explanation, he was referring to cache coherence and basically um, to the smart ways of um, handling and implementing the, the cache for metadata. Uh, but the problem is that it is still unclear. So taking all of those resources into account, we still cannot easily say whether it's linearizable or not. So whether it's a, a C system in terms of the CAP theorem. Uh, but at the end, it's not that bad. So it feels quite strong. It's quite uh, it's quite strong and it's strong enough for all those people that were using S3 through the years and they are, were building their own piece of software in front of it uh, to mitigate the, eventually con uh, the, the eventual consistency. Uh, and we can say that, well, we probably won't get all the details um, because the magician usually does not reveal its secrets. Uh, however, I know at least one magician that's uh, shared with us uh, some of the details of uh, its magic. And the most famous example is probably the Google Spanner. Uh, for those who may not know what Spanner is, Spanner is, uh, is a global SQL database like distributed SQL database running in the cloud, uh, which basically provides very strong consistency guarantees. Um, and the best way to learn about the Spanner and how it achieved that is to take a look at, uh, at the paper called Spanner True Time and the Cap Theorem from Eric Brewer. So the same person who actually um, formulated the Cap Theorem. That's why we should rather assume that this guy knows what he's writing about. And if we'll take a look at this paper, um, we'll see that the spanner is technically a CP system. So it's partition tolerant, but like focus on consistency, but effectively a CA. And that looks quite odd, especially at, uh, at first, because what does it even supposed to mean? Uh, how we can be uh, CA and CP at the same time? Isn't it like against the CAP theorem? And one answer for that could be that, well, if you're rich, the rules apply a little less to you, as in life. So um, the Google itself has um, like years of experience with building um, reliable networks, with uh, SRE, um, with basically everything about the operations. So um, they can mitigate some of the, uh, some of the issues um, almost regardless of the cost. However, being rich is not enough. So even if you have all the tools in hand, you have to be clever enough to use it, uh, to use them. And basically, this is uh, exactly what Spanner does. Uh, so on the very high level, the Spanner combines um, uh, the two-phase commit and two-phase locking. So the, the solutions that we know from, um, from relational database um, to provide the same or similar consistency guarantees uh, uh, and isolation guarantees as the relational databases. However, we all know that uh, 2PC and 2PL does not scale well. Uh, so for example, the 2PC requires all the members, uh, all the com members communicating with each other to be up and running for the whole time. So it's not something really good for availability. Uh, and that's why uh, the spanner also takes uh, Paxos into the equation. So the algorithm for, or the protocol for distributed consensus to mitigate uh, the availability issues um, that uh, the 2PC could, uh, could cause. But a true magic comes with a true time, uh, a solution that acts like a, a synchronized global clock uh, for the whole system. And of course, we may not say, wait, but relying on clocks, uh, especially the local ones is, like known to be to be problematic, so of course um, it will make our life easier if we will have uh, like a global clocks, 
everywhere, but we know it's it's quite hard to to achieve that. Um, what the true time does, what Google does, it basically combines a uh, software with a dedicated hardware. So in this case, we are talking about the GPS receivers and uh, some atomic clocks being present as a part of the infrastructure. Um, but of course, um, it's not enough to like make the clocks always accurate. Uh, so what the true time does instead is actually it represents each timestamp not as a single value but as a range. So we have the earliest and the latest timestamp, and the true time says that the actual time, so the true time, lies somewhere in between. So it is guaranteed that between the earliest and latest timestamp, there is the real time when something have happened. Uh, and the key thing about uh, the true time design is that this delta, so the difference between the earliest and latest, have to be kept very small and have to be predictable. And in fact, as far as I remember, it, it's, sometime, uh, it's something like a seven milliseconds, uh, which is really impressive because, for example, NTP, so Network Time Protocol, um, accepts the, the drifts, um, so the differences in um, after synchronization, uh, even at the level of like 250 milliseconds. So those seven milliseconds, it's like really impressive, uh, impressive stuff. Why does it is so important? So let's imagine that we have multiple, uh, multiple operations or multiple transactions. And if for each one of them, we will have a corresponding true time timestamp. So a range of, uh, of values. If we have those two true time timestamps and they do not overlap, then we know for sure that one operation has happened before another. So we have the ordering. We can use the true time for ordering. However, if we have two operations with uh, the timestamp that do overlap, so those ranges do overlap, then we cannot say for sure whether there is an order or not. So what the true time, sorry, what the spanner does with those true time uh, values is it actually applies a little bit of delay, which is proportional to this um, bounded error of, uh, of the clock synchronization to ensure that we could introduce the ordering. So in fact, um, the, the spanner gets linearizability from using the true time. Um, but we remember that um, spanner was considered or classified as effectively CA. And while the consistency is always guaranteed in case of Spanner, uh, with availability, uh, what, what Spanner provides is just high availability. But this just means it provides five nines of availability. What does it mean? So effectively, a system could be down according to such an SLA only for five minutes and 50 seconds for a whole year which is quite impressive, but of course, it's not the same as being always available according to, uh, according to CAP theorem. Um, however, um, in the paper, um, Brewer says about differential availability, uh, which basically means something like, you won't know uh, that the system uh, is not available if you are not using it at the moment. So in fact, to figure out that Spanner is down, the application that uses Spanner first has to be up and running exactly at the same time. Uh, then it has to um, try to use the Spanner at the very same time. And it should perform an operation that will like target a piece of, uh, of Spanner, which is uh, unavailable, which effectively should mean that um, the availability, like effective availability is even higher than what has been provided in the SLA. So we can say that it's not a crime if you don't get caught. So even if this is not a truly a system, truly available system, um, the users may not notice uh, notice that. So from their point of view, it could still feel like a CA. Um, and as you can see, Spanner squeezes quite a lot out of uh, the CAP theorem. Probably like it pushes it to to the very limits, and it's doing a really really amazing job. Now. Um, we talk about the SLA in terms of the in terms of the spanner. If we'll take a look at the SLA of the S3 service, we will see something similar, but a bit less impressive. So instead of five nines, we have only three nines of availability, which is being guaranteed. Um, what will happen if the service is less available than that? Well, the answer is we will get a credit, we'll get a discount starting from 10% uh, up to even 100% if it will be less than 95%. Um, what does it mean for us? Well, effectively, 
there won't be any discount, even if the service will be down for one minute and 26 26 seconds per day, uh, which means like after four days of such an availability, we have more than what Spanner provides for the whole year. But that, that that's just one side of the SLA. Uh, we have a feature, optional feature called replication time control, RTC, which enables us to replicate the data. So when we are replicating the data across multiple different regions, we can use the RTC to somehow like limit this time if we want to have it predictable. Um, and what we will find in this SLA is in fact an SLA for consistency because uh, the SLA says that 99.9% .9 of our objects should be replicated under 15 minutes. 15 minutes is quite a lot in terms of distributed systems, but it is how it is. So effectively, the SLA is the new cap. So if we have a service that is running uh, in a cloud that we are providing something as a service, where, well, what we have exactly in terms of cap theorem may not be that important. SLA is all that matters to, to the users. SLA is all that they um, can take for granted, nothing more. Um, so in fact, the cap will be usually hidden under the availability guarantees as the availability issues are somehow the easiest to, um, to handle. What does it mean? So first of all, to avoid some problems, let's say with consistency in certain situations, um, for the service provider, it is quite easy to uh, make the service down. On the other hand, when we have a consumer, so we have an application that uses a service uh, and the service is a remote one, it should already be prepared that the service may be down. So basically availability issue is the easiest one to recover on the caller side. Uh, but uh, if you would have um, like something that similar with consistency, so if the consistency will be unpredictable, uh, well, then we would have the worst nightmare of any distributed systems engineer. So the consistency usually has to be predictable. We have to know what is the minimum in, into which we can trust. Uh, and availability um, take, takes a role of a rack to sweep under all of the issues, all of the possible trade-offs that have been made um, on the on the remote system, on the cloud service. So a question that we may ask right now, is the cap only for database and service providers taking all of this into account? Uh, and to answer this question, let me bring another tool, uh, so Cassandra. For those who may not know, Cassandra is a partitioned roles, role store where every part of the data could be replicated across multiple different nodes, uh, which is heavily inspired by the architecture of the DynamoDB. Uh, and one important early decision, design decisions, uh, uh, related to Cassandra was to make it always read readable. So it means that we can write no matter what, even in terms of, um, in case of network partitions, which effectively led to classifying this system, at least initially, as an AP system. Um, and thanks to that, it was able to write things really, really fast. In terms of the design, uh, we have something which I could call a nodes democracy. So we don't have any dedicated leaders, followers, primary or secondary replicas. No, no, all nodes are equal. Uh, and in order to um, like distribute the, the changes that are being made to those different nodes, um, the Cassandra uses gossiping protocol, which is just like in the real life. So we are talking to some neighbors, then they are na the, the neighbors are talking with their neighbors and effectively, uh, after some time, eventually, everybody should know about the latest value. Uh, however, as with um, with all those systems that like um, make a trade-off on consistency, uh, we have to do something with the conflicts. And Cassandra um, handles the conflicts uh, on the read side, so defers the conflict resolution to the read operations. And uh, the conflict resolving strategy would be to basically promote the last write. Uh, but the real um, reason why we are talking about Cassandra today is its feature called tunable consistency. Uh, if we have an application that tries to read or write something into the, into the Cassandra, um, we can define how many nodes should take part into each of those operations. So um, first of all, the application would perform the request to and send it to basically 
any node from the cluster. This node will become a coordinator. And then we can decide how many nodes should be asked for a value or how nodes, how many nodes should agree on the right. We could use like one node, two nodes, three nodes, majority of nodes, so a quorum, or even all the nodes at the same time. Why we want to do it? Well, basically, based on, uh, on those values, so based on the number of nodes, we can get um, various different trade-offs on consistency and availability. Let's imagine the following example. We have uh, five nodes, uh, and every piece of data will be replicated to, the to five nodes. We first uh, set the new value of x equal to two, uh, and we written it only to the one node. And then we are performing a read request where we are saying we would like to take three nodes into account. It is a perfect, um, it, is a, it is a perfectly uh, possible solution uh, situation when none of those three nodes will actually know the latest value. So it means that such a read may return the outdated value. However, if we'll increase the number of nodes to, uh, that we are writing into to three, uh, then such a read request to, again, three different nodes uh, must have at least one node that contains the latest value. And because uh, the Cassandra defers the conflict resolution to the reads, well, during the read request, we'll basically determine that the latest value is, uh, is two, and this value will be returned here. Uh, so with such a configuration, we will end up with something more like a CP system rather than AP. It won't be exactly the CP because of some subtle details when handling concurrent writes, but it will be quite close to it. So effectively, this means for us that we can make different choices in terms of availability and consistency per operation. So it's not only about uh, how the database is doing things, how the database has been designed, but also how we are using it, how we are defining our configuration for, uh, for reads and writes. And of course, there is more uh, because Cassandra introduced some time ago a concept called lightweight transactions, which provides or are aiming to provide a linearizability for compare and set operations. So for example, we would like to insert new user only if it does not exist before. Uh, and Cassandra is able to use Paxos in order to achieve that. However, uh, it is known from various different problems, including the performance issues, uh, which also shows us that this kind of flexibility does not come for free. So we have to do something uh, on our side. I mean, we have to like provide additional configuration when building the app, but also, um, on the implementer side, it pushes a lot of complexity and a lot of potential issues to be uh, to be handled. Then um, let's take a, a look at my favorite tool, so uh, Kafka. And you may say, well, what Kafka is doing here? It's not a database. Why are we are discussing that? The answer is rather simple. So basically, Kafka is a distributed shared data system as any other. So the CAP theorem applies to it as well. And for those who may not know uh, what Kafka is, we can say that it's a distributed append-only data log. And of course, the people that are working with Kafka on a daily basis could say, well, but it's more. It's in fact a stream processing uh, platform, uh, which is true. Uh, but today, we will focus on, on its core, so on, uh, on providing an append-only data log. One important thing about the Kafka design is it, it, that it has been built for scalability. It was built because LinkedIn was looking for a solution that will handle the, the huge, uh, huge load and any of the previous uh, messaging solution was basically unable to do so. Um, so in a nutshell, Kafka basically groups messages, groups data um, by the subject into topics and each topic is then internally being uh, replic it's being partitioned. So we have multiple partitions within each topic. So in fact, a topic is like uh, a bunch of operations, which is then uh, being uh, sliced into multiple different partitions. Uh, and the important point here is that every partition preserves the order of operations, but the, uh, the messages that come from different partitions uh, are basically kind of unrelated to each other. So uh, the ordering of messages is being preserved only within each partition. 
what is the consistency recipe for Apache Kafka? Uh, the answer is relatively simple. Um, it uses uh, leaders and followers. How does it look like in practice? Uh, let's imagine that we have a topic with three different partitions. So um, every partition could have multiple different replicas, uh, but at the same time, each partition could have only one leader. Uh, and the leader uh, has a special role to, uh, to do. So basically the leader will be the one to handle all the writes and to handle all the reads. Uh, as a consequence, if we are producing messages to a single node, uh, then actually it's easy to us to preserve the ordering, so to preserve the, the consistency. And this is the same for read operations, because when we, if, we are, if we are reading from leader, then we will also should see always the same state. However, I've mentioned that we will have multiple different replicas, and the reason why they exist is basically for the replication, so for fault tolerance. And each replica internally is, um, so each a follower, so a non-leader replica, each follower is basically consuming the messages from, uh, from the leader, which means that the followers may lag because uh, they do not replicate uh, changes immediately. This is not a synchronous process. And based on how much this, uh, the lag we have, uh, we have the in-sync and out-of-sync replicas. So um, according to configuration, we can define how much um, a replica could lag to still be considered an in-sync replica. So an in-sync replica is not a one that has all the same messages as uh, on the leader side, but uh, it is, let's say, fresh enough and it's still considered uh, up and running. So if our follower, like the follower C here, will uh, jump out of the, the window that is defined, then it's being considered as an out of sync replica. Um, why this matters? Well, the in sync replica uh, by default is the only one that could become a new leader if the leader will be lost, no matter if there will be a failure or uh, if there will be, for example, a network partition. Um, so when we are performing a write operation, every write operation um, has to like confirm that um, the change has been sent to all the in-sync replicas. So before fully replicating, we have to wait for all the in-sync replicas. Uh, and that's why the pace at which those uh, in-sync replicas are replicating data also matters in terms of performance. Um, to preserve the consistency, uh, the leader basically makes those messages that are not fully replicated non-readable. So they will become readable uh, when they will be fully replicated to all the in-sync replicas. So does this mean that we don't have read your write semantics? If this would be the case, then for sure we don't have the linearizability as well. And the answer for that is it depends. So similarly to the tunable consistency in Cassandra, we have a producer setting called the AC case. And the AC case basically defines us uh, how long we should wait um, before on the producer side, before um, assuming that uh, an operation has uh, succeeded. So effectively, this means how long for how long we should block our operation. Uh, and we can set them to zero, which effectively means we will have uh, a fire and forget semantic. Uh, so we'll, we won't wait until the message will be fully replicated. But of course, it means that we may lost it um, because it's not that durable. Uh, and if we have uh, if we want to have a read own write semantics, we could take a look at the ACKs all, which basically means that we will wait for all the in sync replica uh, to provide us the confirmation that they received uh, a certain piece of data. So, what about a situation when the leader will uh, become unavailable? Um, well, if the leader will go down, we'll have to elect the new leader. Uh, of course, it doesn't have to happen when the leader goes down in terms of being um, so in terms of a failure, but it could be the same when the leader is basically uh, non-reachable from for the rest of the nodes. Um, and then usually we will take one of the instant replicas and promote it to being a new leader. But of course, we just said that the messages um, will take time before they will get replicated across all the in-sync replicas. And in fact, 
if we have such a message that have not been replicated yet to the new leader, then effectively this message may be lost. What does it mean? Well, for us, it means that the consistency, the linearizability has nothing to do with durability. So even if the system uh, will preserve the linearizability, it doesn't mean that the data that we already written uh, will be durable. So in fact, we have to dig deeper into configuration. We have to dig deeper into the details to make sure that our data is durable. Um, I was talking about the, uh, the consistency in terms of Kafka. We can take a look at how to um, like improve the availability more. So we could, uh, have, we could make a further trade-offs of, uh, on the consistency uh, if we want to have something with higher availability. And one way to do it is to turn on a feature called the unclean leader election. And the unclear leader election will basically work like this. If the leader will disappear for some reason, uh, we should um, elect one of the in-sync replicas as they are known to have uh, the majority of data as the new leader. Uh, however, it might happen that all the in-sync replicas during um, during the operation of the system uh, could basically go out of sync. And the uh, unclear leader election allows an out of sync replica to become a new leader. So instead of a situation when we are basically um, blocked and we cannot operate at all, we are accepting the fact that um, this new leader may not have all the messages from the previous one. What does it mean for consistency? Well, those messages could be already um, read by the consumers because um, it all depends on um, so it all depends on the configuration but in general the leader uh, was making those messages read oh sorry readable uh, when the when it, they were uh, fully replicated across all the in-sync replicas and if we run out of in-sync replicas well the leader is the only in-sync replica, so it's enough to write to the leader uh, to basically accept the fact that the message is, uh, is written. So those messages can be lost while still there could be some consumers that already read them. So we, we are doing a huge trade-off on um, consistency, but we can improve availability quite a lot. Another solution is so-called follower fetching. Uh, so the improvement which allows you to um, perform the reads, not only from the leader, but also from the follower. And the initial idea behind it was to support such a case uh, when we have a cross data center uh, replication scenario. So if we are running a, a Kafka cluster, which some of the members are in a different, different data source. Um, and in fact, there is more. So we just scratch the surface of the possible configuration options, but we have things like the flashes. So how the data that are already accepted by the replicas are being flashed internally to the disk. Um, and this flashing basically does not, uh, is not a synchronous operation, but it uh, is being applied with some delay. So it is an, an again, important factor for, uh, for durability. We also have the transactions. So a way of, um, sending multiple messages atomically, even to multiple different topics, which effectively introduces some kind of ordering on the messages um, from, from different partitions. So in fact, as you can see, there is for, for even for a single tool like Kafka, there is many, many things that we have to take into account uh, in terms of the CAP theorem. So effectively the configuration and the parameters, I mean, the parameters that we set on our applications and our consumers or producers define the, uh, the CAP theorem trade-offs. So it's not only on the database side, it's not only on the tool um, side, we are all um, bounded by uh, the CAP theorem and by the possible trade-offs. So a bit earlier than I uh, suspected, uh, we are slowly approaching the summary of, uh, of the talk. So first of all, uh, the CAP theorem is not going to retire. 
So it looks like that uh, it survived um, 20 years already, more than 20 years, and it will probably survive another 20 years. Uh, we still have to obey, we still have to build our systems according to CAP. And despite some systems claiming that they are almost CAP of the, or suggesting that they have broken some of the, the properties, uh, the answer is it's still like a gravity for all of us, for all the people building distributed systems. Um, we also learned that consistency and availability are in fact spectrums. So they are not uh, binary properties, um, at least in general, because in terms of CAP theorem, both of them have been defined really, really precisely. So if we have a consistent system according to, uh, uh, according to CAP theorem, the consistency means linearizability. So any weaker or um, consistency model uh, basically invalidates the C in terms of cap triangle. Then availability is about being always available. So if the system is up and running, uh, the A property says that we will always accept the reads and always accept the writes, like no matter what. Which effectively means that high availability, so something we, uh, the best what we have basically for majority of the systems that we are building, including the ones running in the cloud, is not enough for uh, for the A property of the CAP theorem. So the high availability is being available as much as possible, but it's not the same as being available like all the time. Um, another lesson is that eventual consistency can be a spectrum too. So um, normally we say that we have eventual consistency when we don't have this, this strong consistency, so guarantees like linearizability. But in fact, there are different uh, other models uh, that I mentioned, like read, your, read own rights or the causal consistency, which in many, many cases is, let's say, more than enough for the application uh, designers uh, to make use of, uh, of them. And also the partition handling strategy really matters. So. Um, when we are operating in, in the cluster, when we are operating in the distributed system, uh, we cannot easily say in every possible case whether uh, a partition, a network partition has occurred or whether we have uh, some node being uh, failed or we just have some problems with a network. So effectively, uh, for many, uh, many tools that we will have, the partition handling strategy, so the one that is being defined um, by the uh, by the cap theorem will also have consequences for other uh, different um, scenarios. For the software as a service, uh, the SLA effectively beats cap. So of course we may wonder um, for tools like S3, Spanner, or whatever and other service we will uh, talk about, we could wonder what do they provide in terms of CAP theorem? But what really matters is the SLA, because those are the guarantees that we have to take um, uh, into account when designing our application. This is the best what we could assume about what the system really provides uh, in terms of consistency and availability, because for uh, the software as a service approach, uh, the consistency and availability will basically uh, be a duet, the, mo the more, most important duet for us. So read the fine print carefully. Whenever you will use a service, uh, make sure you understand the, uh, the guarantees and understand the, the SLA. Um, usually the availability trade-offs will be the easiest. They will be the easiest to do on the side of, um, of the service provider, but they will be also the easiest for us, so for people that are building the application that are using those systems. Um, but the consistency should still be predictable because otherwise we'll be quite helpless with when building our software. Um, an important thing is to understand that for many, many tools like Kafka, like uh, Cassandra, not all the operations have to choose the same like consistency versus availability. Uh, so it's not like that, that the CAP theorem is only for database designers. This is one of the reasons why this, this triangle with categories and tools is um, basically misleading or even wrong, because it's not only about the tool, it's also about how we will use it. So we as an application designers have to think carefully uh, how to apply those uh, properties and how to configure the tools, the tool internally uh, to have certain, uh, certain uh, guarantees in terms of consistency or availability. 
And of course, we, are, uh, we identified some of the missing parts of the CAP theorem. So CAP theorem says nothing about the durability, uh, about the latency, about multiple different things, including, for example, the, the node failures. So in fact, there will be a lot of cases when, um, which will happen uh, in the practical, uh, which will happen practically, but the CAP theorem says nothing about them. So we have to think about them uh, like additionally. Uh, but in general, the tools these days can be more flexible than we think. So we definitely have more tools and more flexibility than uh, we had like 20 years ago when the CAP theorem was, uh, was initially formulated. Uh, but of course, the devil is in the implementation and configuration details. Uh, so that's why we have to get to know our tools. We have to read the docs and... When building the application, we have to just make uh, make the, so take the best what we can uh, from uh, from the configuration, from the guarantees, um, to to use them uh, properly to get this much of availability or consistency uh, as we need for our system. Uh, and that's basically all from my side. If you're looking for some references, so for uh, for some um, interesting articles or books. Uh, also, uh, talking about the CAP theorem, this is definitely the list I can uh, I can recommend, uh, and they inspired me also to prepare for this talk. Um, if you if you're still not um, fully tired of me, uh, you can take a look at my blog, so mikemybytes.com, or you can find me on Twitter. Um, I'm pretty active on distributed systems, but also about programming and various different stuff. Uh, so. That's all from my side. Thank you for your att attention. And yeah, I guess we will uh, jump to the questions shortly. Thanks for the talk, Mike. Okay, I will look in our chat and we have one question. Uh, why not read our own rights without replicating to, to all, uh, I, I guess to all, all the followers, because rights are marked as unprocessable, I guess it is related to the Kafka part of your talk. I'm on mute. Uh, yeah, let me jump here. Well, so uh, let's imagine that um, our producer is writing something into, into the Kafka, and now uh, if the same application that produces a message will also consume the message, so will perform a read operation, the reads will also happen from the leader. So until the message, such a written message, until it will be fully replicated across all the in-sync replicas, the consumer, even on the same application, won't see it. So basically, there is a short window when um, we already produce the message, and according to the configuration of ACKs, we can, sorry, our application can already think that uh, this message has been sent, uh, but the consumer within the same application won't see this message. So basically, this is the reason why I think that in such a, a configuration scenario, we won't have the read on write semantics because we've sent something, but it's not yet readable until it will be, it will be until it will be replicated. Of course, if we'll apply the ACKs all, we will wait until it will be fully replicated. So the producer will be blocked until the message is visible. So with such an approach, we will have the read own rights because the consumer could immediately see uh, such a message. I mean, the consumer within the same, uh, same application, so the same process. Yes, okay, thank you. That makes sense, at least for me. Um, well, I want to ask our audience. Guys, feel free to ask questions. Russian is okay. I will translate for Mike, please. And oh, why? In just a moment, while we wait for some more questions, I going to shut something from my side. Um, I personally work in financial domain right now and for certain kinds of operations, we need to be pretty sure that uh, our rights are consistent, uh, that 
they are durable. But on the other side, we have uh, those SLAs, those different kinds of consistency models. And the question is, how would you uh, achieve these requirements for consistency, for durability, while respecting or, or walking around these properties of distributed storages or, or in external systems that you work with? Uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure whether I fully understand it, but let me try to, to answer that uh, somehow. So first of all, um, as I said at the end, um, we can make, for many tools, we can make different choices between um, consistency and availability um, according to what we need. Uh, and in fact, um, when we are building, for example, a financial system, uh, probably not all the pieces have to be like strongly consistent. I mean, like linearizable. Um, but the essential part of the design is to determine which operations uh, do really need it. So from, from my experience, it is quite usual that somebody uh, is going into the, into the meeting uh, and then somebody else is saying, well, we could use uh, an eventually consistent database. Um, and somebody says, well, we need consistency. We are doing a serious business here. So it all depends. Uh, for some of the operations, we will have to configure it like super durable, uh, super consistent. But in many use cases, um, the problem, the eventual, in the, the eventual inconsistency that could happen uh, could be handled differently. So as an example, right? Maybe it's not from the financial uh, per se, but it's still, I think, quite relevant. Um, with uh, when we are running an e-commerce shop, for example, right, and somebody has um, has chosen a product, and eventually it will turn out that the product is not there. Well, the best what we could do is actually to to make a call or send an email uh, saying we we are sorry and offering a discount. So effectively, it may it may turn out that for your business, um, it's not that bad that there was some inconsistent, uh, there was some inconsistencies uh, because you can, um, let's say, compensate them in a different way. But sometimes you won't be able to do it. And in such case, you have to make sure that um, all those things like consistency and durability uh, are uh, enough for you. So if you need strong guarantees, then, well, of course, this would mean that you will lose, for example, on, uh, on availability. Uh, but like you have to be careful and read carefully the, the SLA. You have to read carefully the docs uh, to also understand what they really mean. Because sometimes, um, and this is like the example with S3, so it feels strong, but we don't know whether this is linearizability or not. And linearizability in such case may be the thing uh, that you will need. So of course, um, you have to take a look at the resources and hope that you will find the right answers somewhere. I hope it answers the question. Well, yes, that was right what I was expecting. Actually, in my experience, uh, I've came to some kind of this approach as well because uh, the fact that we transfer money in a database transaction from one wallet to another is basically a lie. You can just do that in a distributed environment. So meanwhile, we have some more questions and I'm going to read them. Uh, this is likely a clarification or, a, or an argument for the first question. So, but if you if you read sequentially, you just need to wait for your one right, right? Um, but um, are we referring to Kafka or? Yes, right. I, I guess it's a follow up on the first question. So the first was, oh, why not read your own rights uh, without replicating to all followers? And the follow up is. If you read sequentially, you just need to wait for your own right. It's yeah. true. Yeah, we, we have to wait uh, for it because the leader makes such, uh, such non-replicated, not fully replicated messages as non-readable. So in fact, when the same application reads and writes data from the leader, 
and let's say that the leader is still operating for the whole time, um, then um, the same cons so the consumer, so the reader won't be able to see the write until it's fully replicated. So I would say yes, that the, the sequence, so the order of messages will be preserved, but uh, effectively there will be some delay, um, which from at least from my point of view violates the, the read own rights uh, semantics. Okay, thank you. The next one is, are Kafka messages lost forever when Node stops being leader and reappears later? That's an excellent question. And um, yeah, the problem with such, uh, with such an example is that, uh, in fact, there, are, there is a huge number of possible cases. When uh, the leader goes down, for example, we may elect a new leader, but this new leader may also like immediately go down. Uh, so some of the messages, yes, they will be lost forever because if the new leader, newly elected leader won't contain them, uh, it will basically um, preserve its state. And after being accepted as a new leader, it will basically accept rights. So it means that if a previous leader will rejoin it will have to like remove the messages that are not present on the on the new leader. This is also a problem for the unclear leader election. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the inter it is an extremely interesting topic because there are so many different use cases that uh, uh, the people um, maintaining the Kafka were building a, a formal verification tool based on the TLA. Uh, to to find out all the possible use cases and determine whether the messages can be lost or or not, uh, and it turns out that it's like thousands of different um, different use cases, even for a small cluster. But going back to the uh, to the question, yeah, those messages will be effectively lost like for forever. But there could be also a situation when like all the nodes will go down and we won't be able to elect new leader. So for example, we don't have the unclean leader election enabled and um, basically our leader goes down and there are no other uh, in sync replicas. So in such case, we will wait until the leader will be available in order to even start working. So in such case, we won't lose anything. When the leader will join it, it will it should be uh, detected as uh, as the latest one, and also should become a, a new leader afterwards. But yeah, there it could be that those messages will be lost. There will be lost for forever. Thank you. This just reminds me of some incidents with not Kafka, but RabbitMQ when we ended uh, one part of the queue being uh, solely on one node and other parts of the same queue on the other node, and it just cannot recover afterwards. So the next one is, am I right that if I want to preserve sequence of messages in Kafka, we should either use single partition topics or do some work as uh, at consumer side to restore a sequence. Uh, well, another another great great question. So basically, the guarantee of Kafka is that the order of messages is preserved only within each partition. So the easiest way of preserving the order is basically either to use a single partition topic, and it's it's a, in fact a valid use case for many. Um, some special use cases like scheduling. I wrote a blog, blog post some time ago about it, uh, but jumping to a typical configuration. So the easiest way is to basically make sure that the messages will be produced to the same topic. The related messages will be produced to the same topic. And then the leader basically, uh, when accepting, when it will be accepting the rights, it will preserve the order in which those rights were, uh, were coming in. So this is the easiest way. And of course, the partitioning itself is a huge topic. We can um, like choose the partition on the producer side uh, like um, in a fixed way. So we can say this message should go to partition two because of reasons. But of course, in majority of cases, we will just use a key-based uh, partitioning. So each message in Kafka is a key value par pair, in fact. So the messages with the same key should land in the same partition. This is the easiest way to preserve it. 
if you would like to do something like that, uh, this across the multiple partitions, well, you could try to use the timestamp, but the problem with timestamps will be that probably those timestamps will be provided by the producer. Each producer will run on a different node and those timestamps will drift away from each other. So you probably don't have the true time on your side. Um, so doing such thing uh, like later, when we already have the messages, let's say, causally related, um, but across multiple different uh, partitions, well, it could be extremely hard or even impossible, at least from my point of view. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment rather than question. So it seems we can build a little bit consistent and little bit available system with partition tolerance. Yeah, and in, in fact, this is also an imp interesting um, aspect of the CAP theorem. So CAP theorem is basically saying that we can take at most two, but it doesn't mean that we have to take the both of them. So it's possible to say that our system is, let's say, designed as a CP, for example, but, um, well, it the, the, the decision itself does not mean uh, effectively that we really have both of the pro uh, both of the properties. So it's possible to build a system that will have none of those properties. It's also possible, technically. I hope this answered the question. <laughs> I hope so. Another one. Can Kafka lose messages even with X equal to O? Um, well, so it, it depends what the uh, losing the messages means in such case. So of course, if we'll send to all the in-sync replicas, uh, sorry, if we'll send to all the in-sync replicas uh, a message, then, um, and if we are waiting, so if we have ACKS equals all, effectively, we are waiting for all of them to confirm. However, uh, it could be that uh, the in-sync replicas uh, will basically go away, so become out of sync. And for this, we have an additional parameter, so min in-sync replicas, which basically says what should be the minimum number of the in-sync replicas to even allow a write. So without it, normally it will be enough to uh, have only a leader to accept the write. So if we have only a leader, which is the, the only one uh, in sync replica, and we will use the AC case all, it still means that only the leader will have the messages. So if then we will enable the unclean leader election and the out of sync replica will become a new leader, we will lose the messages. So yeah, it's possible. Uh, so in many cases, this AC case equals to all uh, is basically combined with this min in sync replicas to set um, this is the minimum. Uh, we need at, at least this number of the in sync replicas and notes that we will um, like let replicate the message um, to, to, to wait. So otherwise, we are risking that after election, uh, we will lose the message. Thanks. That makes much sense. Uh, any other questions, please? Uh, meanwhile, I was wondering, uh, maybe we could somehow overcome consistency limitations of services databases by utilizing some kinds of, uh, well, replication-friendly data types. Is it feasible? Like, like CRDTs, CRDTs or something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So of course, um, like going to the example of, of Cassandra, when we said that uh, we will basically somehow handle the inconsistencies. Yeah, there are uh, some, some data structures like CRDTs uh, that uh, enables us the con resol uh, resolving the conflicts like on the data structure level. So of course it's possible, uh, but uh, if it's not an easy job. So if it would be that easy to uh, define a CRDT for like every possible uh, use case, then we wouldn't have to care because we could solve all the problems later on. And while some of the conflicts are quite easy to, to be done, uh, so we could have like two con potentially conflicting operations that are, let's say, updating the same row uh, in the database, but they are, uh, they are updating different uh, uh, values so different uh, columns, I mean, uh, which, of course, from one side, they are like competing on the resource, but on the other hand, they are not conflicting. 
those kind of problems are easy to be done. But for some of them, you have to think about what to do. And of course, gathering the, all the possible values and like returning an array instead of value to the client is not the way to go. CRDTs are able to like detect that are able to handle many use cases. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, uh, as so, far as I know, to uh, prepare guy, them. Gu guys, guys, sorry, I have to interrupt you. We are already out of time, out of our slot. So let's wrap up a little bit and move to the Q&A session if there is some questions. Mike, thank you very much for the excellent talk. And Nikolai, thank you for the mo moderating. Okay, I think good Thanks. luck. Thank you. See you.